thank you very much for the invitation to speak at uh, Grand Rounds this afternoon. I was kind of hoping it was going to be in the Garhe, but uh, there's a really enthralling lecture on uh, bone pathology going on at the minute uh, for the medical students. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now and hopefully everyone can see my slides. Okay, can everyone see my slides now? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, well, I thought I'd um, take the opportunity uh, to update everybody on um, work that we'll be doing here in Dundee on early detection of uh, bowel cancer, um, an, an area of we've, we've been studying now for uh, about a decade or more. And this, um, it's always a good time to reflect when you're giving a talk. Um, and as a trainee in, in gastroenterology, as an enthusiastic trainee, one of the lessons I had at that time was never ever send feces to the lab because it's the quickest way to upset a biochemist. But with the passage of time, how that has changed. And the purpose of uh, this talk today is to highlight the, the late, latest guidelines issued by the British Society of Gastro and the Association of Colour Proctology, which are for GPs uh, with recommendations to use uh, stool tests uh, as part of the routine assessment of patients presenting with uh, change in bowel habit. And this is a huge step change uh, to patient care. And, it's, and for those of us in Dundee who have been uh, studying this area, uh, it's great validation of the work we've done over the last few years. So over the next uh, half hour or so, I'm going to explain how um, stool testing is, has become so important for the assessment of patients with new symptoms and explain a little bit about fecal haemoglobin and how it relates to colorectal disease. I'm going to go through some of the evidence base to support use of fecal and chemical testing or FIT in the triage of symptomatic patients. Talk a little bit about how COVID led to the accelerated adoption of FIT testing around, around uh, Scotland in particular. But also, I'm going to finish by tackling some of the underlying clinical concerns that, uh, that uh, using stool tests to triage patients may not be safe, and we'll tackle that head on as well. So I'm a great advocate of taking a, a proper history, and we teach our students to ask all the questions, and nine times out of ten, you'll have a fair idea of what the diagnosis is, and the same will apply in primary care. And GP consultations for bowel symptoms are very frequent, perhaps it has been estimated about 10% of all consultations. And if the patient presents with persistent bloody diarrhea or rectal bleeding, it's a no brainer that patient does need investigated or indeed they have iron deficient anemia that requires investigation. But when a patient presents with more subtle change in bowel habit, particularly if they're over the age of 50, it becomes more of a challenge to determine uh, what should be done. Now, Detect Cancer Early an initiative from the Scottish government prioritise bowel cancer as a, tar uh, as, as a cancer to try and detect early. Uh, and this put arguably some pressure on GPs to consider uh, early investigation of patients with change in bowel habit. And as soon as patients are referred in, this places demand on secondary care to investigate these patients in a timely fashion on their urgent suspected cancer pathways. But from the GP's perspective, which symptoms do predict bowel cancer? Well, even with rectal bleeding, only about 5% of patients will have an underlying cancer. And if the patient presents simply with an altered bowel habit, around 2.5% will have an underlying cancer. So it's you know, looking for a needle in a haystack. A number of years ago, uh, back in 2008, in fact, we tried to streamline the investigative pathway for these patients coming in from primary care and we set up a colorectal pathway. 
uh, in essence, gastroenterology took over the vetting of all these referrals. Uh, and around three quarters uh, at that time went straight to test. A, a proportion came to the GI clinic for clinical assessment and a smaller proportion still went to the surgical cl clinic. And that's pretty much uh, stood the test of time. And when you put a pathway in place with stakeholder buy-in, it becomes popular pretty quickly. Um, oh, it's happened to me. I've lost my um, graph. The bottom line is, uh, I don't know what's happened to my graph, but when you put a pathway in place, it becomes very popular. And the number of referrals through the colorectal pathway increased exponentially. About 35% uh, of them were urgent suspected cancer referrals and has to, had to be investigated quickly. But as this box indicates, only a tiny proportion had underlying cancer. And so in the endoscopy services, we were like hamsters on a wheel trying to investigate patients quickly with only a tiny proportion having underlying significant disease. Uh, at NHS England, similar figures reported on their two, two week wait pathways, around 3% having cancer. So, you know, this is going to break the system. And we shouldn't be surprised because this uh, meta analysis in 2010 now. Um, had already demonstrated that symptoms alone were poor predictors of underlying pathology when it came to bowel disease. Indeed, more recent data, and this is from NHS England's route to cancer diagnosis, confirms what we knew already, that around 23-24% of bowel cancers present as an emergency with advanced disease and obstructing symptoms. And we know from the bowel screening pathway, when we target allegedly asymptomatic participants, around 10% 10, 10 of cancers come through that route. Uh, so there's a real disconnect between symptoms and likelihood of underlying disease. Well, what about fecal hemoglobin and colorectal disease? Um, oh, blame me, all these pictures are disappearing. Um, traditionally, uh, we were in a position to measure uh, occult blood with a fecal occult blood test. And this was the mainstay of bowel cancer screening uh, uh, since inception in, in 2000. The fecal occult blood test was available for clinicians to use in the clinic, but one of the issues was uh, quality assurance and appropriate reading of these tests. And so they were withdrawn from ward and clinic uh, base. With the advance of technology, the fecal immunochemical test came along, and this was a great advantage because here was a test with antibodies which were specific for human hemoglobin, very, uh, very sensitive for uh, altered blood in the stool. And from a patient's perspective, they were very easy to use. The GUIAC uh, old-fashioned car required three samples on consecutive days, not good for a patient to handle feces. Um, patients didn't like it for that reason. But this new test is a, a one-off uh, test that's uh, a closed system, much more hygienic. And from the laboratory perspective, it's automated analysis. And more importantly, you can quantify how much blood is in the stool. Uh, now, there are different analyzers available. We're in particular interested in those analyzers, which can give you an absolute concentration of uh, hemoglobin in the stool. And in Scotland, now uh, there are five labs uh, analyzing the concentrations of fecal hemoglobin in the stool and measuring tiny amounts uh, down to as low as seven micrograms per gram uh, with a maximum limit of detection of 400 micrograms per gram. And I'll come back to these numbers later on. So uh, a number of years ago uh, in Dundee, uh, Callum Fraser and, and colleagues had a look at how good this fecal immunochemical test would be at measuring concentrations of fecal uh, uh, human blood and stool. And they studied a uh, number of patients who were taking part in the bowel screening program, were positive on the old GUIAC card and got them to do a fit test as well. And what we could see is, as the pathology developed in the lining of the bowel through low risk adenoma to higher risk, uh, bigger polyp to cancer, the concentration of hemoglobin in the stool increased. Basically, as the lesion got bigger, more blood in the stool. And this, therefore, uh, permitted the switch from GUIAC to FIT testing within the screening program. And it's now, you know, 
those of you who are familiar with the bowel screening program, FIT test is the first line screening test uh, now. And the, how much blood do you need to have in the stool to qualify for a screening colonoscopy? Well, you can set that to match the available resource. In England, uh, the concentration uh, required for positive tests in the screening program is 120 uh, micrograms per gram. In Scotland, it's 80. But we recognise even at that threshold, uh, we're going to miss about 50% of the cancers and in, in, in participants. Um, so there are some issues in, in the screening programme um, with an aspirational threshold to push that down. But to do that, we need to uh, make sure that we're triaging our symptomatic referrals more appropriately. And so uh, we wish to see whether the FIT test was any benefit in the symptomatic patients. And we, we started this uh, journey about eight years ago. Uh, and this was the first paper, so a pivotal paper we had published back in uh, 2015 now. And this was a, a pilot study uh, with our colleagues in primary care where we asked them to measure fecal hemoglobin and fecal calprotectin at the point of referral in for investigation of new onset bowel symptoms. And in that six month pilot period, 750 uh, patients who handed in a poo test came through and had a colonoscopy. And of that, uh, when we measured uh, the presence of fecal hemoglobin in this group, just over 40% had none detected whatsoever. And what we looked for was uh, the test performance for picking up not just cancer, but also bigger polyps, high risk adenoma and IBD. And what we realized was if the test was negative and there was no blood in the stool, then uh, the, only a tiny proportion of uh, uh, patients with pathology would be missed um, if, if you chose not to scope these patients. And within this 12 patients, there were no cancers. So from this paper, we, we sort of uh, uh, also identified actually that um, if there was blood in the stool, then the chance of uh, significant pathology, be it an adenoma, uh, a polyp or a cancer increased from from what we could see of 4% based on symptoms alone to 20% chance of finding pathology. Whereas if the test was negative, there was a very small chance of missing pathology. So we concluded from this study that uh, measuring a stool at the time of referral and identifying undetectable levels could be used in future as a good rule out test of significant bowel disease and avoiding unnecessary colonoscopy and targeting colonoscopy more appropriately. After that, <clears throat> this work was uh, replicated in other groups in England, across Europe as well. Um, around the same time, NICE were publishing their new suspected cancer recognition and referral guidelines and remained heavily focused on these NG12 guidelines on uh, symptom-based referral. Uh, two years later, they revised some of their guidance based on our work and other studies coming forward to suggest, hang on a sec, uh, there is some evidence coming out on measuring fe uh, fecal hemoglobin in stool. And so perhaps we should consider using FIT test to guide referral uh, for investigation, but maybe uh, just keep it uh, for use in patients with low risk uh, symptoms and patients without rectal bleeding. But they made that recommendation on, on the basis of no, uh, no evidence at all. No studies have focused on low-risk uh, cancer patients only. What um, NICE did also suggest was aiming for a threshold of 10 uh, for a positive test. And that recommendation has, has, uh, has stood the test of time, if you like. While NICE uh, were publishing this, we were basically implementing fit into our routine service. Uh, from 2016 onwards, and we published our experience of the first year of the service in 2019. And uh, in this paper, we reiterated that we'd asked GPs to use a fit test as an adjunct to their clinical acumen, and we asked our GPs to take a full blood count at the same time. And in the first year, uh, over 5,000 patients were assessed in this way. And when we measured the concentration of fecal hemoglobin in the stool in these patients, the vast majority, 78%, uh, had a, what we call a negative test, 
yeah, less than 10 micrograms per gram. And of that uh, proportion, GPs on the basis of clinical acumen and a negative fit test chose not to refer two and a half thousand patients. Uh, and what we did was for this paper, we followed them up and used the CHI number to link to the Scottish, Scottish Cancer Registry with a follow-up of two to three years. And in that two to three year period, four of those two and a half thousand patients went on uh, to develop bowel cancer at a later date. And so that gave us confidence that you know, um, if the patient had uh, undetectable fecal hemoglobin and there was no sign of iron deficient anemia, rectal bleeding, a palpable mass or persistent diarrhea, which you'd refer for investigation anyway, then the chances of cancer were extremely unlikely. This work was quite important because of the Scottish government's help and clinical collaboration around the country. Uh, fit testing began to roll out across uh, the country in, in Scotland. Um, this this uh, map, the map of the country is just there to, 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 to highlight that. So, so 2018 was a big, big year in that sense. What we also uh, noted in that first year of study that um, of those positive tests, 25% roughly with a positive test, this was the profile of uh, blood results, uh, fecal hemoglobin results that would come through. Um, the vast majority were uh, in the range between 10 and 100, but about 20% were off the scale greater than 400. And there's this uh, kind of uh, 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 wine glass shaped distribution. Why was that important? Well, what we realized was the concentration of hemoglobin in the stool was a predictor of the prevalence of significant bowel disease at colonoscopy. In those patients with a fit less than 10, the yield of significant pathology was 6% in those who came forward for a scope. Whereas those patients who had a fit off the scale, their yield of significant pathology was 55%. So this gave us confidence when triaging in secondary care to take those patients with very high fit and put them top of the list uh, for colonoscopy, get, get them scoped in a couple of weeks. And this also influenced uh, the practice, the triaging practice of our colleagues around Scotland. Along the way also, uh, we, we also began to realise that neoplasia was not the only determinant of fecal hemoglobin. This study here looked at the impact of uh, finding a polyp and then taking that polyp away and what that did to the hemoglobin in the stool. And this uh, small study here shows that in those patients with advanced adenoma, i.e. big polyps greater than a centimetre, if you measured fecal hemoglobin before and then within about a month of uh, polypectomy, there was a significant drop down overall in median uh, fecal hemoglobin uh, concentration. Whereas in those patients with tiny polyps, taking the polyp up didn't really make any diff difference to the underlying fecal hemoglobin concentration. And these are patients who had no other pathology at colonoscopy. So I highlighted that, you know, neoplasia, be it adenoma, and cancer is not the only thing that gives rise to uh, detectable fecal hemoglobin in the stool. Done in England, this was a massive study that uh, swung uh, the evidence in favour of rolling out fecal immunochemical testing across the rest of the UK. And this paper appeared in Gut Again, which is the, the main GI journal. Uh, and what it was, what it did was uh, report. Uh, uh, in a, in a multi-centre a diagnostic accuracy study, um, the efficacy of fit testing on the cancer pathway patients uh, triage to colonoscopy. And patients who were triage to colonoscopy on the basis of symptoms were invited to take a fit before they had the test done. Importantly, in this study, referral symptoms were also recorded and the accuracy of the FIT test was reported at three different thresholds. The 10, which had been a nice recommendation, a very low limit of detection of two, and a higher uh, concentration threshold of 150. Uh, this is a busy slide, but the bottom line is just over uh, 9,800 patients were included in this study. And if we look at the results, uh, when they looked at the referral symptoms of these patients, bearing in mind they were all referred through cancer referral pathways, 73% had bona fide high-risk 
nice defined uh, cancer symptoms. Uh, the rest were a smattering of low risk and other symptoms warning urgent referral. And the yield at colonoscopy based on symptoms alone was 3.3% 3, 3 for colon cancer, 11% for significant bowel disease. So that had been keeping with uh, published literature. When you look at the impact of fit, uh, knowledge of the fit test result on uh, positive predictive value, here's the three uh, thresholds which were used. Uh, the positivity rate at the 10 threshold, 19%, which is what we'd expect. And the positive predictive value uh, if the fit uh, threshold of 10 was used, 16% um, of those with a positive test would have pathology, which is obviously significantly higher than the 3% based on using symptoms alone. And if we focus in on the 10 threshold recommended by NICE, uh, this would give a negative uh, predictive value of 99.6% uh, and a number needed to scope of uh, only 6.2%. So far superior to using uh, symptoms alone. And this is this a really important study uh, to persuade uh, clinical colleagues in England that the FIT test was the way forward. This study also uh, tackled one of the other questions um, regarding the use of FIT test in primary care. What happens if a patient is presenting with rectal bleeding? What's the point? The measuring uh, fecal hemoglobin in these patients. Well, the point is <clears throat> fecal hemoglobin or FIT measures the hemoglobin and its degradation products, i.e. altered blood. Uh, and what their study showed in the large uh, number of patients uh, with rectal bleeding and, and a FIT result is that if the FIT test was negative, uh, but they had uh, rectal bleeding, then the yield of cancer here was 0.2%. Whereas if the fit was positive, it was 16%. So rectal bleeding, as I said, again, generally requires investigation. But if your fit test is negative, we don't need to look at the whole colon. You can focus your attention uh, on, on the sigmoid and rectum alone, and a sigmoidoscopy will, will suffice. And this is important uh, when it comes to triaging and secondary care. What about those patients with iron deficient anemia? Uh, well, is there any benefit in doing a, a FIT test in this group? Because they're all going to get investigated anyway, right? Um, this uh, paper from colleagues in Glasgow reported their experience in 575 patients with uh, bona fide um, iron deficient anemia who all had upper gyndoscopy and colonoscopy within six months of the feral. And what they looked at was the yield of adenomas and cancers according to their uh, fecal hemoglobin result. Uh, here, three thresholds, minus less than 10, 10 to 200 and greater than 200. And what you can see is in those patients with iron deficient anemia and a negative fit, the yield of cancer was 0.3%. Whereas if your fit was elevated significantly, you're up to about a third uh, or certainly over a quarter will have underlying significant pathology. And so again, very useful for triaging patients with iron deficient anemia. The FIT test has got value. When um, COVID struck and endoscopy services shut down for a period and waiting lists expanded enormously, uh, in keeping with other areas of medicine, this led to rapid uh, a review of services and, and introduction of new pathways. And clinical consensus with all those in Scotland who were involved in studying FIT by this time, uh, produced a kind of referral guidance, if you like, based on uh, using FIT and full blood count and those referrals coming through the service to work out who should be done quickly and who could uh, go down other routes. Um, and this a, a guidance, if you like, was uh, based on some work that we did with colleagues in Fife and, and in uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, where we pooled uh, data on, on those patients who'd had colonoscopy uh, following a FIT result. And this paper describes 4,800 patients who had a FIT test and came forward for colonoscopy. Um, the prevalence of cancer in this group was 5.5%. And we looked at the number needed to scope to identify a cancer in this group. And this table here, looks at the uh, 
uh, fecal hemoglobin range. And if we looked at those patients who came forward to colonoscopy who had a negative fit, to identify cancer, you'd have to scope 155 patients to get one cancer. Uh, this here uh, also looks at if we set the fecal hemoglobin threshold at 10, we reckon we could have saved uh, uh, about 45% of the colonoscopies delivered and we would have picked up 94% of the cancers with a number needed scope of 11. So this gave us the confidence to you know, reiterate the fact that your fit test was negative, your yield of cancer was going to be really low, and think twice about bringing these forward uh, for investigation. One of the long term, so the long term critics of uh, fit based uh, triage would suggest you're going to miss cancers in the long term if you don't investigate these patients. As I explained earlier, we had some evidence in Tayside that uh, would counter that. But colleagues in uh, Spain also uh, reported their experience of using fit test and um, colorectal cancer survival. And this was a retrospective study looking uh, over a, a six year period, um, seven year period rather in Spain, 1500 symptomatic patients who were uh, diagnosed with cancer and reported the uh, fit test at less than 10 and the impact of having a fit test in, in the workup in those patients with cancer. And what they showed was if those patients uh, took a fit test and it was positive, they were more likely to present with early stage cancer, here shown in blue, and less likely to present with cancer advanced stage, here shown in red, compared to patients who did not perform a fit test in the workup. And this graph here, uh, for the first time, suggests that having a fit test in the workup would actually impact on uh, long-term survival with a survival advantage in those patients who did a fit, which was positive. The infer inference being that the fit test was positive, this perhaps might lead to more speedy investigation. With a couple of students here from the medical school, Dwee Delson and Mark Ward, we to look, look back at our own experience in, in Tayside of uh, fit-based triage on, on cancer diagnosis. And this work has just been accepted for publication in colorectal disease. Um, and our question was, you know, we've been using fit now since um, the beginning of 2016. And, and did this result in any missed cancer or delayed uh, presentation? And we went to cancer audit data and identified all those patients who were diagnosed with cancer in Tayside uh, over uh, four calendar years. And we looked at the mode of presentation. Were they presenting through uh, emergency routes or primary care or whatever? Um, did they have a fit uh, test result? Uh, was it performed in the workup? And what was the stage of diagnosis in the cancer patients? Uh, 1,245 patients presented with cancer over that four year period. Um, and this graph here shows the mode of presentation over time. Um, in blue here, you can see those cancers presenting through primary care, orange, uh, bowel cancer screening, gray, emergency presentation, yellow here, yellowy gold, surveillance, and these are the other routes. And so we can see over that four year period, the proportion presenting via primary care routes increased from 43% to 53%. Bowel screening, uh, as a mode of presentation increased significantly from uh, 14 to 20 percent. Emergency presentation, pretty steady, and actually fell to 14.8 uh, percent, but there's no significant uh, difference there, certainly not worse. And other routes, well, we noted this drop off in surveillance, and that's largely because surveillance colonoscopy was uh, suspended um, uh, to prioritize new uh, patients. What about those cancers that, that came through the primary care route then? Um, so uh, 581 cancers overall came through the primary care route. And of them, 75% uh, had a fit in the workup uh, prior to referral. And uh, um, the positivity of it, you were 414 were positive. Uh, 20, 26 uh, of the cancers were negative, 
So the sensitivity of the fit at 10 was 94% for bowel cancer, which is, which is pretty good. This here shows the uh, increased use of fit test in the workup for cancer patients over the years, such that uh, about 86% of all the diagnosed cancers in primary care had a fit in the workup by 2019. These graphs here show uh, an analysis looking at the stage of diagnosis in those patients who had a fit done in the workup versus those that didn't. And what you can see here is a difference in the dark colors here, brown and blue, between the fit group and the non-fit group, um, demonstrating that if you had a fit done, you were less likely to have advanced uh, disease at the time of diagnosis, whether that's staging through the TNM or the Duke staging here shown in the lighter uh, grey and blue. So we can, these graphs are just not playing, but uh, we basically concluded that fit based triage was certainly not associated with uh, the late presentation of the fit was done in the workup. So that gave us lots of reassurance. So uh, to summarize, you can go and read the guidelines, but the bottom line is fecal hemoglobin concentration is better than symptoms alone in predicting colorectal disease. Um, I hope I've convinced you that using fit in primary care uh, to, to assess new onset bowel symptoms is not associated with uh, delayed or missed uh, cancer diagnosis. If anything, it may be, may be better. And uh, the guidelines are certainly clear now that fit testing should be used as an adjunct to clinical acumen. Um, in primary care is a rule out test to work out who should be referred and who may not require referral. And in secondary care, we can certainly use it to, to triage the, the test uh, priority and speed to colonoscopy. So what about what we do next? Well, uh, we know in those patients whose fit is off the scale, fit 400, about 20% will have cancer in there. And we fast track them to colonoscopy, which means 80% of the time, there's no cancer there. And so, ourselves and other groups around the country are all looking to see what else can we study over and above the fecal hemoglobin result to refine risk prediction. So we have a number of studies going on at the minute. Uh, Jenny Nobes for her PhD is uh, studying uh, the role of uh, circulating cell-free tumor DNA and whether we can bolt that onto a fit result. Uh, Judith Strachan for her PhD is looking at the role of uh, serum proteins to see whether there's any anything we can add on to the fit result there. We're also looking uh, to the role of uh, serum infrared spectroscopy and working with health informatics, uh, trawling through our vast uh, quantity of uh, blood result data to look at full blood count parameters such as platelet count um, and MCV as other pointers uh, towards refining our risk prediction scores. And finally, the other bit of work we're doing uh, is funded from the CSO to look at the impact of FIT on uh, referrals, uh, colonoscopy resource, and uh, time to diagnosis. So lots of work still to be done. A lot of people have um, participated in the work uh, over the years. Uh, too many to mention in one go, but I'm acknowledging them here on this slide. Okay, I'm going to end my um, presentation now, and I'm happy to take any uh, questions.
Jake, perhaps I could ask a question. Um, what more do you think we need to do to convince people who are still not particularly convinced by this technology? You know, colleagues perhaps even within Tayside and certainly um, out with us when, you know, they've still got nice guidelines and things. What, what do you think we need to do? Is it just continue to publish and promote, do you think? I think um, education, 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 I think that's the key thing. Um, one of the dogmas which which we need to challenge, I think, particularly for bowel cancer, is that uh, is to get away from this notion that some somehow symptoms are, are important. They're important to go and get investigated. Um, but equally, if you have no symptoms, it doesn't mean to say that uh, you shouldn't take part in screening, for instance. I think that's one of the challenges. But, you know, uh, as within many other branches of medicine, you know, there's a perception that uh, the symptoms are the be all and end all. Um, and erroneously, I think uh, over the years, the dogma has been that uh, certain symptoms uh, carry more weight than others. And is trying to get away from that dogma is the real challenge. And I think we should probably learn from our experience um, with uh, helicobacter infection and dyspepsia you know, I'm old enough to remember when everyone with indigestion was getting referred for upper endoscopy through a fear of missed uh, cancer and perhaps peptic ulcer. And then we realized that a test and treat strategy of testing for helicobacter, doing some non-invasive testing, would decide who, who needed investigation, who didn't. So in many ways, the FIT test is your, is your test and treat it's non-invasive and, and will determine who needs needs the invasive investigation. And I remember all the resistance to helicobacter test and treat from the advocates of endoscopy. Um, and I think we're probably at the same juncture now. There's a query in the chat. Greg, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I can't see that. As well, the threshold of 20 reduce the bias against women? That's a, that's a really good question. I haven't really talked about that, but um, this is more pertinent to the bowel screening programme, where uh, the cutoff threshold to qualify for uh, bowel screening colonoscopy in Scotland is set at 80. Now, this the subject for another day, but uh, what we do know is there's a natural biological difference between men and women, and that women are much less likely to, to uh, have uh, high concentrations of uh, hemoglobin in the stool. When you plot out the profiles of men and women, the profiles of fe fecal hemoglobin are much lower in women. And that means if you have a universal bowel screening threshold, then uh, you're going to disadvantage uh, women by definition. And that's borne out in the fact that when we study interval cancers, i.e. those patients who took part in the screening program were reassured the test was negative and then are followed up and found to have a cancer at a later date, interval cancers are predominantly found in women. Um, now, one way to get around that might be to uh, lower the threshold uh, but that would uh, uh, favour men and women uh, in unequal degrees because it would favour men, continue to favour men more because of the different uh, uh, fecal hemoglobin profiles. It might be better to argue for different thresholds for men and women to to ensure parity and access to bowel screening colonoscopy. I think that that's probably the argument to be had in future um, to, to thresholds for women taking part in screening. Um, the, the difference in thresholds between screening and symptomatic is also quite important. Um, patients shouldn't be falsely reassured that if they have new symptoms and they did a bowel screening test three or four weeks ago and they were patted on the head and told their thing was fine, uh, they should be encouraged to do a, a symptomatic fit test and, as well. And, uh, and we're using a lower threshold of 10 and, and, and we can pick up cancers at, at that low level for sure. OK, 
okay. Greg, there's one more comment from uh, David Gowdy, perhaps. Is David on the call? I might just want to ask it. Yeah, okay. What do you think of the role of fit testing for patients with higher prior risk of bowel cancer because of family issues? It's a good question there. Um, we looked at um, fit testing in, in our surveillance cohort uh, a, a few years ago. And one of the challenges there is um, uh, patients under surveillance are there for a good reason. They may have a ge genetic predisposition. And certainly you would not feel comfortable about decline declining a surveillance colonoscopy on the basis of a, of a fit test. However, the fit test might help prioritize those patients on a waiting list um, and uh, lead to more early investigation rather than the standard, you know, two, three or five years uh, surveillance uh, cycle. So I think particularly now when there are uh, massive backlogs for surveillance colonoscopy after COVID, there's certainly an argument for using fit tests to uh, triage those patients on the on the screening uh, waiting list um, to uh, speed up their investigation if they're found to have particularly high uh, levels. Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, David. Is the relationship between the positive fit result and patients on anticoagulants? That's, that's a good result. That's a good question as well. Um, not that not that are aware of. Um, which I suppose is the other thing. Um, we haven't, we haven't formally studied that with regards to fit uh, testing. But um, as I alluded to earlier, it's not unusual for us to, to find um, a normal colonoscopy in patients with a significant fecal hemoglobin. And uh, Bob Steele and, and Callum Fraser published in, in GUT previously on uh, the, their experiences in the bowel screening program in patients who've done a, the old fashioned GUIAC test, looking at what the you know, um, uh, looking at association between subsequent uh, mortality. And that corrected for things like anticoagulants, which we know can give you false positives. Um, and uh, certainly having fecal hemoglobin in the stool is a bad thing, it's associated with worse mortality and also associated with comorbidity. But I think, um, you know, anticoagulants per se, it wouldn't alter my interpretation of a, of a positive fit result, and I would investigate them in, this, in the same way. Okay. There are no other questions. I think we we uh, we'll call an end to. It. Hopefully, you found that enjoy enjoyable and, and um, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your time.